Howdy. Can everybody hear me? All right. Good. Uh, I have a tendency to speak too quickly, and since not everybody here is a native English speaker, maybe I'll try to slow down for this. Um, what we're going to talk about today is look at some statistics that we ran on our mobile app assessment practice. Um, you know, we really had a question, you know, looking across these, uh, you know, assessments that we were doing, <clears throat> you know, we had some thoughts on where it was most important for organizations to focus and the types of tools and techniques that were most effective in finding vulnerabilities. Um, so we had some prejudices about that. Um, so instead of just continuing blindly with our prejudices, we decided to uh, actually go back and run some stats on some historical data that we had. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I'm Dan Cornell, I'm the CTO at Denim Group, um, and as the CTO, uh, that kind of means that nobody knows what my job description is, so I have broad latitude to do whatever I want and think is fun, as long as uh, every once in a while I can show up at a conference like this and give a talk, um, and then post my slides on SlideShare. Uh, and so a couple years ago, uh, yeah, I really started looking into mobile application security um, because it was a really fun area. Um, you know, you, people get to do stuff with mobile that's really exciting. You know, you can like take pictures of checks and deposit them in the bank, right? You've got uh, you, you maps that follow you around the GPS. So, you know, we saw a lot of organizations doing really cool stuff with mobile applications. It was an opportunity to really do some innovation, um, you know, in, in, in a way that they, you know, hadn't been able to in, in you know, other parts of their, uh, you know, other parts of the business. Um, and so obviously along with that, uh, comes risk because you are taking an application if you think of a web-based application that runs you know predominantly on the server side and you're taking some of the code and some of the data for that application you're putting it on an untrusted device that people uh, you know carry around in their back, back pocket they uh, you know sell it on eBay when a new model comes out they accidentally drop them in toilets uh, you know things like that and uh, and so you know that led us uh, in a lot of organizations to say you know what are the security implications associated with these systems and so really what we're doing is now looking and saying, you know, because we believe we need to have some sort of a testing program in place for mobile applications, what are the things that it's most important to focus on and what kind of tools and techniques are going to provide the most value? Um, so just the agenda, I'll provide a little bit of background about the data set, um, you know, kind of uh, you know, what, wh where the data came from and to characterize for you, uh, you know, what may be in or out of the data set. Uh, and then we'll go through the findings. And what we'll, what we'll look at is three different areas. We'll look at the types of vulnerabilities that we identified. And so trying to identify you know, four real world applications that developers are building that people care about. What are the types of vulnerabilities that we identify or that we see most frequently, right? Um, and so uh, we'll talk a little bit about the OWASP mobile top 10 and, and, and look at how our data lines up with the, uh, with the way that the top 10 is laid out. Um, to see you know, where there are cases of overlap and where do we maybe find things uh, more frequently versus the uh, you know, you know, more theoretical concerns in the original version of the OWASP Top 10 Mobile. Um, we'll also look at where these vulnerabilities were identified. If you think of mobile applications, right, unless you're building a, you know, like, a, like fart noise applications, which we're, for whatever reason, rarely asked to come in and do security assessments of, right? I mean, we're talking about like banking, you know, your banking insurance type applications. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's not just about the code that runs on the device. You're looking at a system of applications. You've got code that runs on the device. You've got enterprise web services that are probably supporting the, uh, the, the mobile application. And you may also have third-party web services that are doing things. And so we'll look at where do we tend to find the most and the most serious vulnerabilities during these assessments. Uh, <clears throat> and then finally, we'll look at what tools and techniques were used to identify the most and the most serious of vulnerabilities. So you've got, uh, you know, again, the kind of two major classes of tool. You've got static testing, looking at uh, code at rest. You've got dynamic testing, looking at code while it's running. Uh, and you can also do those both with automated tools as well as uh, manually. And so we'll look at the, uh, you know, kind of blend of the vulnerabilities that came out of both these uh, automated activities as manual activities, static activities, and dynamic activities. Uh, so the data, uh, this data set comes from uh, 61 assessments, um, you know, spanning across 20 applications. We've actually got some newer data that I really wanted to include for these slides, and I had a little bit of an IT 
incident uh, that I will be cleaning up. Um, so the data still exists, I just need to restore it from a backup. Um, and uh, we will have new stats. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this basically looks at a set of 957 vulnerabilities. So just under 1,000 vulnerabilities that were identified across these various assessments. Uh, what we found is, uh, you know, again, the worst assessment was one where we found a, an application that had three criticals, uh, but all of the assessments uh, had at least one vulnerability. So, you know, much as with web application uh, testing, anybody here, you know, web app pen testers and pen testers, you always find something, right? There's, the, there's, there's, there's <laughs> you know, finding the vulnerabilities for most organizations or more, most pen testing teams is not the problem that's convincing someone on the other end to actually fix vulnerabilities, um, but that's a, uh, it's a whole, whole different uh, discussion. I got a whole slide deck on that, but that's, uh, that's not what we're looking at today. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about like our view of the mobile application threat model, um, you know, which is, you know, which probably applies to most all of the applications that we're looking at here. Obviously you can have, uh, you know, situations where you have a, a more complicated threat model or a simpler threat model, but most mobile applications tend to, uh, from a template standpoint, look like the one we'll talk about in a second. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about our uh, assessment methodology. Uh, and again, this is, a, this is data from a subset of the assessments that we've done, but these are assessments where there was both dynamic testing as well as static testing, as well as a manual component and, a, uh, and, and an automated component, uh, and where we looked at both the code on the device as well as the supporting web services. And so, um, you know, we've got other data that we had, but to normalize this, we're looking at uh, you know, kind of that population of assessment. So pr a pretty comprehensive look at the security of a, uh, uh, of a mobile application system. So the mobile application threat model that we see the most is, um, you know, you've got the, your application is running, or a portion of your application is running on the device. And so you've got code running on the device that's doing stuff, right? You've also got data living on that device. <coughs> and the, you know, again, one of the reasons that mobile security is so interesting is because this threat model is complicated. Because you know, if you think about this device, you know, you've got these mobile systems where uh, you know, it's running on a, a piece of hardware that you probably don't control. Uh, you know, that you, uh, you, know, you can try through your mobile device management and stuff like that to control those in your IT environment. But if you look, you know, you know, the vast majority of these applications are customer-facing applications, right? And so you don't, you know, if you're, a, if you're a bank, you can't say, well, hey, customer, before we'll let you deposit checks online, you need to register your mobile device with our mobile device management system and use our, uh, use our container. You don't have that type of discretion or the ability to push down policies like that. And so it's really interesting to say, we're going to take this untrusted device where the user might be malicious, and we're going to install part of our application to run on there. You know, furthermore, like, even if the user is not malicious, you could have a situation where the user has inadvertently installed malicious applications on the device. <coughs> and so um, a really uh, you know, kind of an interesting evolution of what you see um, in a typical web application. You know, obviously also these uh, applications all are supported by some sort of web services. Right? From a security standpoint, applications that run only on the device aren't necessarily that interesting. They get more interesting when they can connect back and move money or cause other transactions and things like that. Uh, and what we saw in a number of cases is these applications also are supported by third-party web services, uh, right? So they're talking out to, uh, you know, again, to Twitter or some of the social media, or they're talking to, you know, a map server, or they're talking to get shipping data or something like that. And so as an enterprise, you control how your web services run, but you don't have direct control over the security of these third-party web services that you might want to, you know, to work with the application as well. And so... Again, um, you know, this creates a situation where you're looking at a system of applications that have to work together, um, and uh, you know, which is again challenging for the you know from a design and development standpoint, uh, but also important from an assessment standpoint. When you see a lot of talk of mobile application security, the focus is on code running on the device, right? Hey, we can you know test the code running on the device and look for security flaws there. Um, you know, I would argue, uh, and I, I think in a lot of cases that is because the vendor that is talking to you about mobile application security is selling something that can test code running on the device. I'm a consultant, so I sell manual pen testing, so let's talk about the whole system instead. Right? And so it's, it's not that we're unbiased, we're, we're differently biased, but uh, that leads us to look at this from a system standpoint to say, let's look at how all of these components work together and you know, you know, work together to do something useful and the security implications at the seams between these components in the system. 
Uh, so again, these assessments tended to have a combination of both static testing and dynamic testing, uh, as well as a combination of some use of automated tools and review the results, as well as uh, you know, manual uh, penetration testing or code review. Uh, and the scope for these, uh, the assessments that you know, got rolled into this data set are you know, those where we're testing the code in the device, we're testing enterprise ser uh, services and third-party services if they're, uh, you know, if they're available. From a severity standpoint, we used DREAD uh, for this data set. Anybody here still like DREAD? All right, good. A couple of people. CVSS? Anybody? All right. <laughs> it's good. Uh, and so the important thing, though, is that we you know, had a, a structured way of looking at this data where you look at the you know, damage potential, reproducibility, exploitability, affected users, and discoverability. And as we'll see, um, these, like a couple of those knobs or a couple of those dimensions start to matter um, when you look at the severity of the vulnerabilities that were identified, uh, especially when you look at things like, uh, like uh, affected users, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, so again, just pretty standard, these get ranked, average it up, and then you know, criticals are the ones from here to here, so on and so forth. We also normalized all of our vulnerability type data back to CWE. Um, yeah, I think the, 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 the quote from, uh, I think it was Winston Churchill, said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the other ones. Right? Like, so <laughs> CWE is, is frustrating. It may be the world's worst vulnerability taxonomy except for all of the other ones. And so, uh, so I actually I actually grown to, to like CWE um, you know, through use, uh, you know, choose on this and some other stuff. But that's, uh, you know, from a vulnerability type standpoint, that's what we normalized everything back to from the different tools that were used as well as a manual, uh, you know, manual testing. Yes? Um, and great question. Yeah. So the difference between CW or the, uh, the common weakness enumeration and the CV or common vulnerability enumeration, um, CVEs are examples of known vulnerabilities in specific pieces of software, um, whereas the CWE is a description of a type of weakness in software. And so it's kind of the difference between SQL injection on the CWE side and SQL injection in you know, this bulletin board application version 2.2.3, which would get assigned a specific CV. So basically, we have to map with uh, CVE or CWE. A defect has to be mapped with CVE, right? Um, a defect would typically be mapped to a CWE for the type of the vulnerability. And if you went to MITRE and said, we want to register a specific known vulnerability for this specific piece of software in this configuration, then it would be assigned a CVE. Mm -hmm. In that case, we'll have to map it with CVE. Um, I would imagine you would first characterize the problem via CWE, and if it was in a known piece of software that other organizations would be deploying, uh, then it would go. You know, then it would be appropriate to get a CVE assigned for that particular you know, specific bug. Yeah, thank you. Uh, excellent. <coughs> um, so, you know, why do we use C, uh, CW or CWE? Um, again, we wanted to be able to speak. Um, you know, all the different tools have kind of their own spin on how they name things, um, and CWE is pretty exhausted. It's a little bit sprawling at times, um, but it's a, it's a pretty well-adopted standard in the space uh, versus any vendor-specific functionality. A lot of vendors have mappings from their tools into that space, um, and so it, uh, you know, it ended up being a, you know, a, a pretty clear choice for the type of data that we look at. Uh, so as I said, this is a subset of the assessment we've done um, to characterize, like if you think of the type of applications that, they are, that these are, these tend to be customer-facing applications, not internal user-facing applications, um, and really centered in the, uh, in the, the finance and insurance space. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, again, not a lot of people are coming to us to do uh, security, uh, exhaustive security reviews of uh, Angry Birds uh, part, whatever, um, which is unfortunate because I have a feeling our folks would really enjoy that. <laughs> um, well, I'm just, I'm, I'm working. This is, this is all work. <laughs> um, and uh, these are primarily iOS and Android applications with a little bit of, uh, you know, WAP Windows Phone 7 and uh, Blackberry and stuff thrown in there. Um, so, if we look at the types of vulnerabilities we found, and I, and I want to look at, for all the data points that we talk about, um, I first want to look at the overall vulnerability like count, uh, or the, you know, looking at all the vulnerabilities we found. But then what I think is a little more interesting is to drill into, you know, like, or limiting it specifically to the criticals and highs that we identified. Um, just because, uh, you know, how many people 
actually read to the bottom of the pen test report. Right, we're in the, we're like the low, you know, the informational stuff. <laughs> right, nobody, nobody actually gets there. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think that that's a challenge that we see in a lot of vulnerability statistics that get reported is we talk about like, oh, well, there's you know, 3,000 vulnerabilities identified and whatever. And it's like, okay, well, that's a big number. All right, but what does that what does that number really 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 mean, um, and uh, you know how serious are those? And so you know again you see well open source code has X number of flaws per whatever. It's like well how many of those flaws do we actually care about, right? And and how is that software deployed? And so um, I don't think it's perfect, but I do think kind of tightening the view to look at only the criticals and highs uh, provides the type of information that. Um, that is most useful to organizations that are trying to economize their budget from a, an assessment standpoint, uh, you know, from a level of effort standpoint to say, you know, here's what we can actually, here's what we actually have time to do. Um, so again, we'll look at the overall prevalence and then look, um, you know, dr drill in more specifically. Um, so if you look at the most common uh, CWEs overall, uh, we see a lot of information leakage, uh, you know, through log files, through information exposure. Uh, we see situations where um, you know, we had clear text vulnerabilities, uh, or sorry, clear text transmission of, uh, of, of sensitive data. Uh, and all these slides are, uh, are, are all going to be online and stuff. So. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, improper input validation, external control of a, of a, of a system or configuration setting. <clears throat> but when we drill in and look at the criticals and highs, uh, what we see are, uh, you know, SQL injection problems, uh, you know, typically on the server side, are a problem in mobile applications, just like uh, others. Uh, we see some information leakage situations, um, but we also then start to see things like access control bypass um, of, of uh, you know, looking at traffic going to the server side as well as other access control issues. Uh, you know, the middle ones there are, all, are almost all, uh, you know, access control and user management things. Um, and so if we look at the OWASP top 10 mobile, is anybody here from the OWASP mobile top 10 project? Anybody? I thought there was one. Okay, excellent. Uh, good. <coughs> And so, uh, you know, for folks you know, uh, who may not be familiar with that, uh, there's the OWASP top 10 web risks, which is, uh, you know, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, you know, looking at web applications. The OWASP mobile top 10 is uh, basically the same list, but looked at, you know, focused in on these mobile application systems. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, uh, is, is a great... Uh, you know, tool to get developers uh, some basic information about uh, mobile application security. That is a great starting point for a lot of uh, for a lot of folks. And so, you know, if you look at that, you see a number of different things. You know, weak server side controls, insecure data storage, uh, insufficient transport layer prote uh, protection, uh, unintended data leakage, uh, poor authorization and authentication, broken crypto, client side injection, you know, security decisions via untrusted inputs, improper session handling, and lack of binary protection. And so. Um, what we did is we took our data and said, you know, how well does this line up, you know, this subset of, uh, of, of assessments that we've done, how well does this line up with what the uh, folks in the OWASP mobile top 10, you know, view as being the most serious risk? And where we saw uh, a strong overlap with our data uh, as compared to the OWASP mobile top 10, uh, we saw a lot of problems with people uh, with server-side controls, so weak server-side controls, uh, poor authentication and authorization dealing with access to web services, and security decisions being uh, done via untrusted input. And so there's, you know, those are all kind of in the same area where you're saying, I've got something on the server side, I'm accessing it from the client side, and those interactions are not, uh, you know, are, are not great. And so we saw a lot of vulnerabilities, especially serious vulnerabilities, that reflected those types of problems. Uh, where we did see some overlap with the types of vulnerabilities that we found, you know, problems with data storage, uh, problems with data transmission, uh, bad session handling, you know, as well as data le leakage and crypto issues. And so those are the ones where we, you know, we, we saw that in our assessments. Um, <coughs> You know, maybe they weren't as, uh, as, as frequent or maybe they weren't as uh, severe in the instances that we identified. Uh, and where we saw a really weak overlap is in client-side injection as well as a lack of binary protection. Um, and uh, I think the client-side injection stuff is a vulnerability like it makes sense, you know, things like you know, SQL injection on the client side, you know, to in SQL inject a local, uh, you know, SQLite database, like, yes, you can do it, but what is that, for, for an attacker, what does that really get you, right? You know, if, uh, you know we, and, and we also take the philosophy, um, you know, when, when we look at these assessments, when we look at the architecture of mobile systems, is you can't trust anything on the device. You shouldn't store anything sensitive uh, on the device. And so, uh, you know, again, what that means is, you know, we, like, don't see a lot of instances of client-side injection. Uh, also, from a lack of binary protection standpoint, 
that's not something that we look specifically at, but we instead look at the, um, like we would still ding folks on design decisions where they would maybe expect the binary protection to provide some sort of you know, obfuscation or protection. Um, so we would find those issues, but we find them in other areas. Um, and so we don't look, uh, you know, just in, in, in our methodology, we don't specifically look at the binary protection stuff as its own like vulnerability or weakness that an application could have. Um, so that, uh, you know, I, th I think reflects uh, or you know, would, is the reason for the data, you know, kind of coming out as it uh, as it is. So. It was really interesting to me to see where we found the vulnerabilities. And again, this is something that we had a sense of, uh, but we'd never looked at in a really structured way. Uh, and, and a big message that we've had, again, since we, since we started looking at mobile application security is, you know, it's not just about the code running on the device. The code running on the device is important. Uh, there's, you know, obviously potential problems uh, that you can introduce with the code running on the device. Um, but you also have to realize that these applications are communicating back via these web services and those web services potentially have even uh, you know, an even greater uh, you know, reason for exposure. And so what we saw is that uh, you know, if we look at all the vulnerabilities, 36% uh, of the vulnerabilities we found were based on code running on the device, 62% uh, were based on code running on the corporate web service, and uh, third-party web services were responsible for 2% of the vulnerabilities that we identified. Uh, one other note I'll make about the third-party web services, uh, one reason for the numbers there being low might be that not all the applications we looked at had third-party web services. Pretty much everyone had a corporate uh, web service, um, which is why it was important enough to do a security assessment of. Not all of them had these third-party dependencies. Uh, in addition, we didn't necessarily always have permission to test these third-party web services. Um, you know, and so that's, uh, that's one kind of side note. You know, we had an interesting situation where we were supposed to do a mobile assessment, and the, uh, you know, and, and, and the company the, that was providing this third-party service and also you know, sold other components of the system, you know, we're gearing up and we're like, hey, we need credentials so that we can do this testing. And they said, no, you can't test our stuff. And we're like, no, no, but the, you know, this, the, the bank asked us to go and, and do this testing. And they're like, no, you can't. Like, you don't have security or you don't have permission to security test our stuff. And we said, okay, well, they're your customer and they want to test it. And they're like, not in the contract. <laughs> um, you know, and so, so in, in certain cases, we weren't able to look at the third-party web services. Um, you know, I would imagine or it would stand to reason that if you looked at the uh, you know, corporate web services and third-party web services, uh, I have no reason to believe that people who build third-party web services are like extra good at identifying vulnerabilities. Um, you know, so I would expect that those numbers to be higher if we did have more assessment coverage there. Um, you know, but uh, you, know, it, it, you know, it also, the, when you're communicating back to a corporate web service, that's probably when you're dealing with your most sensitive data, where your financial transactions and stuff. And so, uh, again, I think for serious vulnerabilities, we'd still see more, we, I would expect to see more things in the corporate web services versus the third party services. If we drill in and look at the uh, it, it, it only the critical and high vulnerabilities uh, it shifts around a little bit. We see again 25% of the vulnerabilities were identified on the device, 70% uh, of the vulnerabilities were identified in the corporate web services, and uh, you know 5% were uh, were identified in these third-party web services. Um, so again, you know what this what this basically says is, you know if you're mobile application security program solely consists of testing the device itself, um, you're going to miss uh, you know, two-thirds of the, of the potential serious vulnerabilities uh, that are out there. And so, uh, you know, again, this is something that we've been talking about for a while and is certainly uh, you know, was, was confirmed by this data, which is, yeah, we're finding stuff on the server side that is, uh, you know, that is more frequently and, and, and is potentially very serious. You know, in addition, if you think about it, that makes sense, especially as you drill in on the criticals and highs. You know, if you go back to you know, talking about the affected users, right? You know, if I have a problem where I um, you know, wrote a mobile app and I store a username and password on the device in the clear, right? That's a security problem, right? Everybody would agree that's not cool, right? Because somebody loses the device or something. But like, if, if I'm a bad guy and I want to exploit that, I've got to like sit outside the bank branch in the bushes with like a potato and a sock, and then like you know, <laughs> hit somebody in the head, <laughs> take the phone out of their back pocket, and run away. I have one username and password, right? If I want to do it again, you probably reuse the potato, reuse the sock, right? You know, sneak up behind somebody, hit them in the head, take their phone, run away. Now I have two usernames and passwords, right? Like, 
that's an exhausting way to uh, you know, to have to chase after credentials, <laughs> right? <laughs> and and it's not terribly safe because eventually you're going to hit somebody with a potato and they're going to turn around and beat the crap out of you, right? So it's if you know if if I'm an attacker, <laughs> it is a lot more interesting to me to sit in the comfort of my basement or a coffee shop or whatever uh, you know, movie image of a hacker you want and attack the web services because if I find a problem with the web service, it's much more likely that that problem I found with the web service is going to impact all of the users of the system or I'm going to be able to get access to more data, right? And so there's a tremendous amount of leverage um, from an attacker standpoint in looking at the server side because if you find something, you can expect that um, you know, the value of that vulnerability to you is going to be higher than one where ex exploitation has to be done on a you know, per device basis. Um, and so, again, that's uh, you know, kind of confirmed our bias, which is to say you need to look at the whole system. You know, what we saw is a lot of these web services, like number one, you know, with web applications, I think most people have finally figured out if you have like an admin directory that should require authentication, you actually have to protect that with something. Right? Like most, most people have figured that out on web applications. Uh, you know, as soon as the web applications all went to Ajax, all like, people forgot that again <laughs> somehow. And people have re-forgotten it for uh, the mobile world supported by web services. And so an interesting thing that we saw in doing these assessments is the web services had never been subject to any sort of adversarial traffic. Right, it was always like you know, we render the screen on the mobile device. The mobile device makes a request for something. The request is perfectly formatted, and so therefore we give you a response. And so as soon as we started fuzzing these web services, um, you know, or as soon as we started trying to like manually craft requests where we you know, walk through different uh, you know, uh, you know, identifiers and things like that, the services either just fell down because they weren't used to like goofy traffic, or we found that they had no. Uh, you know, concept of authorization, uh, you know, sometimes no concept of authentication on the services side. And so, you know, that's something that I think is really important to communicate to development teams just because, uh, you know, again, in the web world, most people have finally figured out that they need to have an actual control in place rather than just guessing no one's going to, you know, surf to the slash admin directory. Um, the people who wrote these web services in our, uh, you know, set of data apparently didn't get that memo that that also applies to, uh, you know, to web services. <coughs> um, so now, I want to look at like how did we find these vulnerabilities? And again, talked about uh, you know, how you know, these these assessments were a combination of static testing, looking at the code while it's at rest, um, you know, and dynamic testing, you know, looking at the web applications while they're running, or testing the mobile application you know, on a you know, live device or in an emulator. Uh, you know, also looking at automation. You know, were the automated tools that we're using with, were those the ones that we're finding the most and the most serious vulnerabilities? or were those found typically by the manual penetration testing or manual testing, uh, the stuff that we did. Um, and so what we saw was the in, the, in the static space, you know, the static tools or static testing method was able to you know, identify a lot of vulnerabilities, um, but a lot of those tended to be the lower risk vulnerabilities. And so, um, you know, we're, we found, you'll see, you know, we found a lot of critical stuff with static testing. You know, but there was also a lot of uh, you know other stuff that it found that are the uh, vulnerabilities that are, you know, I mean, I guess important to identify or, or you you have to identify them, um, but that uh, are not necessarily uh, the ones that are going to be a priority for remediation. Uh, in the dynamic space, again, we saw more low risk things be identified in the dynamic space, um, you know, but uh, you know to a lesser uh, you know, to a lesser degree. And so if we look here, again, just looking at the percentages what we see in the static uh, you know, space, the, from a raw vulnerability count, you know, 93% of the things were identified um, you know, doing static testing uh, and were low, um, you know, 66% in the, in the dynamic space. Um, if we go and look at the critical and high-risk vulnerabilities, uh, yep? Um, maybe it's a little said already, but um, by dynamic analysis, is that automated? Uh, it's, it's, it's any testing of the system while it's running is, is dynamic, and then we would you know, split that into automated dynamic analysis or manual dynamic analysis. Manual dynamic analysis would be more like pen testing. So, yeah. or, uh, or like forensic testing running, you know, like using the device and looking at uh, you know, logs and artifacts and stuff like that, but it's uh, you know, hands-on, like doing stuff testing. <coughs> um, so what we found was, you know, if, we, if we drill in and look at the 
Uh, if we drill in and look at the uh, you know cr critical and high vulnerabilities, what we find is you know that was responsible for finding you know 59 percent, almost 60 percent of the uh, of, of the those vulnerabilities were found with static testing, um, you know versus 41 percent with the dynamic testing. Um, but it, an important thing to remember is that from a raw vulnerability count, we also in addition to identifying the really serious. Um, you know, the really serious stuff, it also identified a whole lot of stuff that is not necessarily as important. Uh, and so as we'll talk about, you know, when you're deploying static analysis, you've got to be very um, attentive to how you tune and use the rules so that you can get the maximum benefit from the tool, which is identifying these like very serious vulnerabilities, um, you know, with the flip side being that you, uh, that you, you know, have uh, respect for your analyst time so that they're not bound up uh, you know, looking at things that ultimately might not be the more important stuff. Uh, if we look at automated versus uh, manual, um, <clears throat> you know, again, uh, what we found is the automated testing you know, identifies a lot of low-risk stuff, um, you know, but a lot of the high-risk stuff, yeah, whereas you see uh, you know, a, a little bit different uh, setup um, you know, where the manual testing identified uh, a, number of, uh, you know, a number of critical and high vulnerabilities uh, and had less you know, kind of noise associated with that. And so if we drill in here and look, uh, again, we found more, of, this is actually a little interesting from a, uh, you know, from a vulnerability count standpoint, um, you know, again, we would expect to find more with automation, um, you know, where it's, uh, you know, kind of chewing through large code bases and, uh, you know, if you, if you have rules that are like low grade vulnerabilities, you would expect, you know, potentially a bunch of those to be kicked up. Um, you know, what we found was, you know, automation still had an edge from a percentage of the serious vulnerabilities that we identified. Um, you know, what is it? It's a uh, you know, 58 percent. Uh, you know, with the manual testing finding 42 percent. And then if we drill in there and look at uh, at, at overall, uh, maybe more useful to look here. You know, what we saw was for the serious vulnerabilities, um, manual dynamic testing was very effective in identifying serious vulnerabilities, and automated static testing was uh, was, was the best at finding. What Oops, sorry, yeah, there we go. Uh, manual uh, dynamic testing was the best at identifying uh, or identified a, a serious number of vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, automated static testing um, with uh, you know not that much, um, uh, you know, with with really not that much of the serious vulnerabilities being identified by manual code review, uh, and none being found um, by the uh, by automated dynamic analysis. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, so if you, if you look at this data, like there's not a you know, I, I wish I had like one brilliant thing to tell you, and everybody can put it on Twitter and just be like, "Yeah, yeah Daniel Cornell, <laughs> you know, he really, you know, he really figured out mobile assessment." Uh, like, because the challenge is, what we found was, uh, like, each of these techniques, uh, you know, both static and dynamic, both you know, manual and automated, uh, had value, and you had to, and, and you found serious vulnerabilities in the various components of the system. And so, I unfortunately don't have like a silver bullet to say like, "Hey, guess what? Just ignore." Code running on the mobile device because like you're never going to have any serious problems with it. You know we did identify again. You know 25% of the time or 25% of those serious vulnerabilities were uh, um, were were on the device. Uh, you know similarly, <coughs> you know from a from a tooling standpoint, like you really need to use a combination of tools to identify these types of vulnerabilities. Um, but what you can also see is that. Um, you know there's uh, certain things that are more effective than others. Like looking at this, I might say, you know what. You know, we were able to identify almost everything that we needed. Um, you know, if, from, from a from a serious vulnerability standpoint, you know, <clears throat> manual code review didn't really pay a lot of dividends across this. You know, we, we didn't find a lot of serious stuff. The manual pen testing did in this case, um, and so you know, if if you've got to take something, if you're looking at your uh, you know level of effort budget for your internal team or an external team or something, you may say, well, hey, you know, what if we back off this activity? What is that going to save me, and is that going to be you know, am I going to be able to live with an acceptable amount of risk for having not received that coverage? Um, you know, I'm not here to tell you one way or the other to do that, but that is uh, you know based on this data, uh, you know, if you've got to economize, that may be a decision that you that you'd make. And one thing I'll also say is the reason that I, we didn't see a lot of automatic, automated dynamic testing uh, results, uh, given, uh, any results out of that from a serious vulnerability standpoint, the testing tools for testing web services uh, I don't think are nearly as effective as the ones for testing web applications. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's kind of an opinion that I have um, that uh, is 
loosely based on numbers now, um, so that's nice. Um, and what we also, we don't see a lot of automated dynamic testing for code running on mobile devices, right, to, you know, fuzz mobile devices and stuff like that. And, you know, we've, we've played around with doing some things like that, but again, what we found out was, like, if I can, like, fuzz a, an application and, you know, find a SQL injection, do I really care about a local SQL injection in a mobile application? Uh, I mean, like, you know, we're, we're coming from the assumption that the device is owned and you have to design the application such that if it's separated from the user, that the user is not going to, uh, you know, be exposed unnecessarily to, to risk. And so we've kind of you know, already made the decision to say, you know, that that, uh, you know, from a, from, a design, or from a design recommendation standpoint, we've already made that decision. So, you know, that makes local fuzzing for a lot of types of applications not necessarily that interesting. And it's not to say if you've got an application that's receiving arbitrary documents, you know, that you want to be you know, concerned about buffer overflows and things like that. But again, looking at these line of business web, or you know, sorry, these line of business mobile applications that are user facing, uh, for a lot of use cases, that's not, um, you know, maybe that's not as, uh, maybe that's not as important. Um, one, we'll jump over this real quick, because that just starts fights. That's uh, which one had more problems, iOS or Android? Yeah, <laughs> and, and I actually don't think that that data uh, is, uh, is, is super useful, which is why it's in the slides, but we skip over it. Um, and another interesting thing that, uh, that just, just to mention, we include in our assessments a, a section called like other observations that are not identified vulnerabilities, but that talk about things that we saw that were maybe not in line with best practices, maybe reflect like a weakness or potential uh, you know, potential for vulnerabilities to be introduced as the code evolves. Um, and, you know, in this case, we had, uh, you know, the, the set of data that we had was, like, you know, almost 2,000 other observations um, that we, uh, that we uh, identified during the course of these assessments. And so we had 1,000 vulnerabilities and 2,000 other observations, and they were, uh, like, almost exclusively identified as uh, you know, static analysis results on the device. And so, uh, you know, again, and I'm... You know, certainly not saying anything negative about static analysis, other than that when you roll out a program, uh, you know, in our case, because we're doing third-party assessments, we've got to look at all that data and sort through it, right? I mean, that's just from a contractual whatever standpoint we had to do that. Um, but if you're crafting internal programs, it's important to tune the rule set so that you know you're looking for the stuff that you consider to be the most serious and the most interesting. And so that's, that's one recommendation that we had, uh, you know, coming out of this. Um, so, you know, what to test? Mobile apps are not standalone. They're systems of applications, and serious vulnerabilities can and do exist in any of these system components. Uh, and from a, testing uh, from a testing standpoint, mobile applications do benefit from testing, or from automation, uh, you know, specifically in the static analysis area, uh, based on what we found. Um, but you also need to do dynamic testing, and that's typically going to be a lot of, uh, that's going to be where a lot of the manual time spent goes into. Um, so, uh, so you can plan your uh, mobile app strategy with that in mind, um, and, and, and really think about the value that you're getting from different testing activities. Um, I don't, did anybody here in this room have more time and more budget and more people than they need to do their job? <laughs> no, exactly. So, so that forces folks, uh, you know, forces organizations, forces folks to make some tough decisions sometime. Uh, and again, our hope is that by looking at the effectiveness of different techniques and identifying what are the most serious vulnerabilities, that will provide at least a quantitative basis to say, you know, hey, I've, I've got half the budget that I want. Here are the, here are the areas where I'm going to peel things back uh, in order to, uh, you know, in order to, you know, be able to live within my budget. Uh, the next steps, uh, you know, we're actually working with the mobile folks. Um, you know, uh, they're collecting data from us and from a bunch of other folks, uh, you know, looking at the, uh, the prevalence data for different types of vulnerabilities. Um, so I'm excited about that to see the mobile top 10, you know, kind of evolve uh, based on the types of things that we're seeing as well as the stuff that other folks are seeing. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, this is uh, something where we've got an ongoing, well, as soon as I restore it, we'll have an ongoing database. Uh, and so this is something that I'd like to keep reporting on just to, uh, you know, to, to see how this evolves over time. Uh, any questions? Yeah, would you please go back to that slide with the Android purchase iOS? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so iOS uh, had 6.5 uh, vulnerabilities per assessment versus uh, WAP. They had only three. So you heard it here first. WAP is twice as secure as iOS, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's why. Now everybody takes a picture of that slide. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so we talked about a lot of uh, you know logging issues. We mm -hmm. talked about uh, mobile storage. 
research. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, are we also considering uh, uh, the permissions which are you know, enabled? Uh, um. So, uh, uh, which category you think it will fall in from mobile uh, uh, OS topping? Uh -huh. uh, is it under uh, uh, lack of binary protection? Um. So we, we typically don't look as much at the permissions. Like, or so you're talking about like for an Android application to say, why does this flash that application yeah. have internet privilege and you know, yeah, yes, context so privilege? Uh, application, mobile application which uh, enables uh, uh, the, the call, mm -hmm. mobile uh, call, uh -huh. uh, uh, for the applications which are not required. Right. And so that is, that's more of a, I, I, we, we view that from a security lens, we view that more as a hygiene thing. Um, that we have seen some, uh, and, and looked at some things where like vulnerable applications can like try to attack applications that have too many permissions. That's less, really for the, what we're doing, that's often less of a concern because if, if, if a company wants to have an app that shouldn't have a lot of privileges but have a lot of privileges, it's probably because they're siphoning data out Right, which as a as a user of the app, concerned about privacy would be alarming. As a as the person fielding the app, like it, then it's working as designed, right? And so uh, so we don't. Uh, you know, it's not that we don't consider it, but from a from a use case standpoint, most of the folks that we're working with, like have whatever set of permissions attached to the application in order to do the stuff that they want to be able to do. Um, and so if we went and said, well, it seems like you got an awful lot of permissions, they're like, no, but that's so we can steal people's contacts and mail them to the internet and, uh, you know, and mark, mark it to them or whatever. So. so as for you, it is not a defect, it is uh, just an observation. Uh, that, would probably, that would probably be uh, an, an observation. Uh, again, unless we, saw, unless we saw a situation where like an Android where you had like intents that were being fed into the application that would be like would have a direct path to using that functionality. Yes. Um, you know, that would that would be typically flagged as a vulnerability, but uh, but from a practical standpoint, based on the data, I don't know that we've. Uh, I, I, th I know that we look for cases like that. I don't believe we found any cases where where, where there was a, a security impact associated with those types of behaviors. I have found one case wherein uh, uh, the application was allowing other users to upload some data, uh -huh. upload some content, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the application has privilege. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, to execute in the local storage. Uh -huh. so, uh, Probably not good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. And so, yeah. And so, again, that we we Excellent. look for things like that with uh, you know the manual uh, with, with the manual uh, you know code review and the manual uh, you know penetration testing and you know testing on the device. Um, you know what what the data tells me is that we didn't identify situations like that in in, in the set of data that we had. So. Yeah, and, and so based on the data that we've got there, you know, typically the business logic problems that we're finding, like, like number one, like looking at the interaction between a mobile application and the web service, like that's, you know, with a challenging threat model that it has, like the, it, uh, it, it all comes down to business logic because it's a question of like, okay, what kind of data was this and did you store it, right? So storing data on a device, not a problem. Storing passwords or social security numbers, not so cool, right? And so that involves like the automated tools, like automated data can identify those potential situations to say you took data from here and you stored it on the device, but that still requires a human to come in and say, well, but the, the data that we took was like a recipe and we stored it on the device, not a problem, or that data that we took is uh, you know, a password and put it on the device. Um, also, like, uh, and, and so that's more looking at, at the device side. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the server side with the web services, we saw a lot of problems with authorization um, that are uh, you know, that typically are identified by manual, uh, you know, penetration testing and business logic. You know, the um, automated tools aren't really good, uh, in, in my experience, at understanding this user should be able to see this but not see this. You know, that's the type of stuff that gets tested for and identified by uh, humans.
Right, right, right. Okay. Um, I would say that the, I mean, typically these assessments start with a threat model that I would characterize under that activity. And I would need, uh, they, they don't let me estimate anything at work because I always underestimate everything. Um, <laughs> so I'm, so I'm going to quote you some numbers that are probably lies. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would guess that that is maybe the first, like from an engagement standpoint, that's the first like, 10 or 15% of the engagement uh, is doing kind of a sketched out threat model to understand like, okay, what does this do and what does this, like, and you, you guys care about this, is this regulatory, uh, whatever. Um, you know, within, uh, you know, and then followed by the, you know, automation runs, you know, filtering the automated results and then going in and doing the manual testing. So, yeah. Right, and, and note I don't advocate hitting people with potatoes and socks. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, like, an, an, an interesting, and this is a, a little bit of a flip comment, but like the biggest, like when I look at that, I think the biggest risk is reputation risk for the financial institution that did that, right? Because that's like, uh, you know, you know, re reporter bait to say like, oh well, you know, like uh, you know, these folks had uh, you know, vulnerabilities in their mobile application. It's like, okay, well, yeah, that's you should not store sensitive data on the device. If it's lost, that would be compromised. But again, that gets factored into from a uh, you know fr from an exploitability standpoint, that gets factored into the, the the ranking of that stuff. But like the biggest risk that we've seen from a lot of financial services organizations is when somebody takes like the leading 10 mobile banking apps and runs them through some sort of testing and says, we found 3,000 vulnerabilities in the apps and like that, uh, there's, a, there's some reputation risk associated with that. And so, um, you know, again, that's kind of a flip answer, but it's, but it's true. Uh, and we've seen that drive uh, organizations' behavior to say, you know, hey, we got dinged by these folks that are, you know, found this thing that we dispute and don't think is very serious, but we need to, like, in order to not get dragged into that conversation, we need to make sure that we're avoiding this stuff. And, and that does shape, uh, you know, th that shapes some of the methodology where we're you know, looking for things. Uh, again, from a vulnerability standpoint, um, not to say that those are unimportant, but, uh, but the, the, that impact factors into how those are, are risk ranked. And sometimes customers need to source sensitive data. Like I work with customers, like they store the private keys, for example. Mm -hmm. Even if they store it in the key store and Right. So there's some cases that are extreme, and I don't want to do it. You have to store it in the cloud. Right, and, and in that case, you make—I mean—you make a risk decision to say, like, am I able to build the user valuable functionality that I want? Um, you know, or what risk do I have to take associated with that, and how do I mitigate that risk? And so, if you're saying, well, okay, I've got to store something sensitive, like I really need it on the device because I have—I can't expect to be able to go and get it from the network. Okay, well, it's encrypted in the key store, and it's set so that you can only get that once the, you know, if, if the, you know, things, uh, you, know, uh, you know, if you've entered your passcode and stuff like that, you know, or you design around, uh, you know, or you design around, uh, you know, from, a, like, we see a lot of use with, like, authentication schemes where it's, okay, well, you enter your password, and that gives you uh, an ability to use the site for a while. With a shorter PIN code, you can use the application to do less serious things, and so you've, you know, you, it, it kind of causes some contortions, but making a you know, decision to say, these, this is the experience we need to provide to users and the capabilities we need to offer to users, and in cases where we're forced to make what, like a security purist would not agree with a certain decision, um, you know, you've, you've got to make a decision to say, we're going we're, we're gonna to do this or we're not, and we're going to put in these uh, you know, things to mitigate the potential exploitability or the impact of that. You know, it's, we had a really, I had a funny customer, a conversation with a customer where you know, they were saying, well, oh, we should only use BlackBerry because BlackBerry has the blah, 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 security feature. And I said, cool, what percentage of your users are on BlackBerry? He said 10% were actually about to decommission the app because it, you know, we don't have enough users, right? And so like, at the end of the day, it's the users and providing value and innovation to users that is driving organizations to do really cool stuff with mobile. And it's security's job to make sure that they do that in the safest way possible, but that they, but they are still able to meet their mission of delighting customers and doing cool stuff. Because at the end of the day, they're going to do it. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's for security. It's good to, you know, to to be a voice in the room to say, like, well, if you're going to, can we do this instead? Or if you're if you're absolutely going to do that, then at least do these things for me. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I think most of the results from this were a combination of uh, Fortify and check marks on the static side and app scan and burp on the dynamic side, um, which is not, not, I don't want to get anybody mad at me. <laughs> that's, that, that's, that's what, uh, you know, that was, uh, you know, and probably, and almost certainly zap. You know. oh. <laughs> But uh, that, um, if like thinking back over when these assessments are done, those were probably the tools that were most frequently used uh, for that stuff. With with some other things thrown in, I think uh, I know we did some NTO stuff with their uh, you know, web service and fuzzing and stuff like that. And we've got a pretty big toolbox, but those are the ones that are probably doing the bulk of the of the work. Which ones were the best for static analysis? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's another that's another slide deck, and we're not uh, we're not going to get into that. <laughs> it's too too late in the conference to start that fight. So. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, yeah, I don't think that we saw a lot of duplicated results because the testing, uh, you know, whereas with um, like web application testing, I think the static tools and the dynamic tools, like for example with cross-site scripting or SQL injection, are both pretty good at finding those, you know, through, through different means. Um, and so then you would expect there to be a significant amount of overlap. You know, typically what we're, like if you look at from a coverage standpoint, um, these tools are, there, there's not as much overlap from the tool set and the methodology um, that we would have in looking at these mobile applications, um, you know, versus a web application thing where you could, you know, have a, here's my static analysis tool run, here's my dynamic analysis tool run, and like, like how do I stitch those things together so that I don't have to like go through the you know, results twice. So in this case, I don't think there's a tremendous amount of overlap because we're using, again, we're using the automated static to find SQL injection uh, to find certain usage patterns on the device, whereas we're doing manual testing to identify, hey, did this stuff that, you know, with this stuff that got stored, is that sensitive? If I change this number, can I look at someone else's account via the web service and stuff like that? So. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you.